Hey, welcome everybody. I am super excited to be here today with you. Thanks for a little bit of patience there, technical difficulties, but it's all worked out. We're super um, in an interesting spot, right? In our world, in our planet, and and what we're and in business and what we are engaged with, um, whether it's association, some type of organization, uh, whether you're an entrepreneur or not. Uh, it's, it's kind of this, this thing is kind of hit everybody at the same time in the same, uh, same general way, right? We're all struggling with, with the same general thing in different ways. Um, this webinar today, all about the secret to increasing capacity during a crisis. Now, really the, the, during a crisis, I just took a, you know, an opportunity, put that in there for this actual presentation. This is something I teach to my clients. Um, I've been teaching them for years, and this is something that I will continue to teach uh, after this is over. So, what, like I wanted, like I said, I think this is a, a, something that applies to us in all walks of life, right? Um, but in business, it's all about kind of capacity. How do we increase capacity, right? Um, we're we're always feeling limited. And it's always like, oh, if we just had more time and more money, then we'd be able to do more stuff. Well, I challenge that. And this presentation is going to walk us through that whole concept. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep going here. Um, Adam, let me know if there's anything that uh, we need to kind of slow down on or check uh, here in the future. So um, I am Scott Waldron, uh, Scott with a K and one T. Uh, I did that in sixth grade because I was tired of putting my last name on all my papers because Scott Wilson and Scott Woodruff were always in my class and I had to put my last name on everything. And I said, no more. Um, I'm going to uh, spell it S-K-O-T and I never had to put my last name on anything ever again. So I started my branding career early. Uh, I've been doing this for 18 years now uh, at, as a professional. No, not since sixth grade, but as a professional, I've been building brands and helping people learn to communicate more effectively uh, increasing capacity in various forms, uh, for 18 years. And I've have, I'm a speaker. I do webinars as you've been seeing now. I've been doing a lot of these, just did one yesterday. And, uh, I'm also a teacher at the Miami ad school in Atlanta here. Uh, I'm currently based in Atlanta and I've been working with over a hundred plus clients on, in various capacities, whether it is branding programs, uh, positioning and marketing message development, all the way through um, actual execution, design work, and internal communication with teams, organizations, leaders, and things like that to understand what their brand is all about too, personal brand. So uh, these, these companies on the screen are companies I've worked with in the past. If you want to find out more about me really quick, you can go to scottwaldron.com. That's S-K-O-T-W-A-L-D-R-O-N.com. You can also find me on Instagram at Scott Waldron and on LinkedIn. I would love to connect with many of you there. So um, I post a lot of free content on there. Check that out. Let's get on with it. So the first thing I always do in every presentation, I'm a brand guy, okay? Brand first in everything I do. Brand. What is Brand. Brand is not your logo and is not a color palette and it is not your font choice, okay? Your brand is what people say about you when you're not around. So that could be your personal brand. So if I go out to lunch with you and then I go uh, home and that evening I say, hey, I just had lunch with Jerry. Jerry is so funny. That dude is blah, 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 right? So that is Jerry's brand, right? Jerry's brand came out. It had nothing to do with Jerry's logo. It's Jerry's, that essence, that reputation. Now your company has a, has a brand, okay? Oh, I love that particular company. I love that product. I love that service. Or I hate that product. I hate that service, right? That is that company or that product or that service's brand. Um, likewise, and this is where it goes a little bit deeper. And what I'm going to talk to you more about today is that your internal culture, your workplace culture has a brand, your company has an internal brand. And that is what do my employees think about me when I'm not around, right? Um, what do my, what does my leadership team think about me? What is my, uh, what do I think as an employee about the company, right? When I go home at night, am I just kind of like dog in the place. That's the reputation of that company, that organization, that association, whatever. That is the problem, right? Is that if you have people that are talking poorly about you when you're not around, that's a brand problem. 
whether it's an internal employee team leader company brand problem or an external customer client uh, product service brand problem. It's all brand. It's all has to do with effective communication. And in times of pressure, chaos, stress, that is when your true character is going to be revealed or your brand. Okay. Under times of chaos, pressure, and stress, that is when we see the true colors of those that we lead, those that are leading us, our company all come through. That is when our customers, our clients will truly see what we're about really come through. Well, most of the time, unless it's being, you know, uh, cloak, uh, smoke and mirrors, right? Type stuff. But um, we'll see that true thing start to shine through a little bit. So internal brand, again, think about this. What do the employees say about me or the company when we're not around? So if I'm leading a team or if I'm on a team, um, or I'm the leader of this organization, what are my employees, what are the people in our organization saying about us when we're not around? External brand, okay, is what do my customers and clients say about me or my company when we're not around? So you've got two brands, okay? Don't think of brand strictly as a marketing term. It's mostly used as a marketing term. I am trying to shift that thinking into your internal health, your internal brand, has a lot to do with the external execution of your marketing materials and your brand to the outside world, okay? Um, two quick things I'm gonna give you. Uh, an internal brand assessment. If you're interested in this, it goes through a few questions that'll kind of gauge, give you a number based on the health of your internal brand. Um, you go to scottwaldron.com. You just go right there and click a resources button in the top right hand corner and you'll see the free resources uh, come down right there. So somebody about the internal brand said, I never thought about our company having an internal brand, right? The assessment asked some good questions that really made me think. I know we have some things to work on and it's clear now. So that assessment will kind of give you some holes. You can give it to multiple people in the organization. You can kind of see what other people are saying. It's really good to kind of check your health there. Now, likewise, I have an external brand assessment. You can also take this. Um, they're both free. And this is on the same page that you'll find the internal brand assessment. And somebody said about this one, the assessment gave me something to think about when it comes to how customers perceive us. Uh, the questions helped me label the things I needed to help market my business um, or more effectively for the long run. So this is something I want you to think about long term. Your brand is a long term investment. Your brand is not an overnight fix it you know, do it now, forget about it type of thing. Your brand is either going up or down every day based on that engagement that you have with an employee, with your staff, with your team, also with your customers and your clients on the external side. Now, the goal today is to learn to maintain or increase capacity with our current and future teams. And I'm going to give you a few tools and a few um, kind of insights about how you can do that. First, I'm going to introduce you to the overarching idea, right? The flywheel. And that looks like this. So the flywheel, which we call maximizing team performance, um, is this is kind of the formula, right? Uh, it's a flywheel because as you do these things better and better evenly, then it goes faster and faster. Now, the idea behind this is that a lot of companies, a lot of leaders tend to come into an organization and they want right? They want alignment, get on the same page, and then they just want to get it done. Let's get on the same page and let's get it done. That's alignment and execution. They really just focus on those two things, especially in during stress, just especially during times like this, when we just got to get things done, right? Alignment and execution. Now, we know that you won't have great alignment and execution if you just focus on that. You, you will get what we call compliance, but you will not get engagement. We want engagement from our teams in order to truly maximize performance and increase capacity. If we are just doing things that are breeding compliance, there's not going to be any long-term loyalty with that person. There's not going to be any long-term investment. There's not going to be any influence or trust built with that person. Um, engagement is really where that's going to shine through. And those first two modules, I'll go back really quick. Number one, number two, communication relationships. That is where engagement is born. 
That is where that is fostered, right? Um, through that true engagement, that trust building that we do. After that, then we truly, truly get more dedication, more loyalty, and what we do there. So let's start. Let's talk about the first one, that okay, communication. And the thing I want to introduce you to here is a program called Five Voices. And um, this is was a program created by Giant Worldwide, and I am a giant. Uh, a Five Voices facilitator, 100x leader. And what I do with this is I go in and I train organizations, first and foremost, to be healthy on the inside. I teach them about brand strategy and I teach them to create that brand strategy, positioning in the marketplace, how to clearly articulate your message to the world, how to target that individual that you want to target and really get deep. I really dig and uh, pull out the gold. That's what I'm really good at. Um, likewise, once we have that brand strategy, we need to get um, on the same page and consistency within our organization. That's where communication comes in. So communication, how do we build that? Well, it's really comes down to understanding what it's like to be on the other side of us, understanding our own communication style and the communication style of others around us. Now, a lot of you maybe, possibly, probably have heard about the Enneagram right? Or you've heard about your DISC, the DISC assessment, or you've heard about the uh, Myers-Briggs assessment. Now, what I have found, I've taken all of them, uh, what I have found interesting about those and the problem I've had with them or seen other people is that not everybody memorizes their numbers or their letters or what they mean. Um, when they do memorize that they're an uh, INTP or an INFP, whatever, I'm an INFP, I memorize those, then I have to think about what do those letters mean? And then I have to think about what does that mean for somebody else, right? What does that mean for somebody else? That's great that I'm self-aware, but if I have to memorize 10 other people on my team's letter formulas and number combinations, that might be a little bit difficult. The founders of um, the Five Voices system are Myers-Briggs geniuses. They took all the Myers-Briggs science and boiled it down into five separate voices. And these are the ones they go in order from quiet to loud, nurturers, creatives, guardians, connectors, and pioneers. And um, based on the data that we've received or that we understand from Myers-Briggs, um, nurturers make up 43% of the population. These are your people people, your people that really have uh, a really good intuition about what's going on around them. Um, how other people are going to react to a certain situation. They're the relational oil uh, in all relationships. And these are very present oriented people, but they're very quiet. Okay. Um, they're very hesitant to bring challenge. They're very, uh, kind of sitting in the background. Uh, maybe they discredit their own beliefs a little bit or their own value a little bit. Then we have creatives. Creative does not mean you're good at art. It means it's how you think. Okay. Creatives are, um, have a lot going on up here. They're very strategic out of the box thinkers. They are uh, very kind of the canary in the mind. They can see off way in the future, see things that are coming that are good, and also see things that are coming that are not so good, and uh, be that early, early warning uh, radar system for us. They also have a hard time communicating all the sometimes what they're really thinking and what they're really trying to say. Um, so they are only 9% of the population. They're future-oriented thinkers. Guardians. These are your process people, your spreadsheet people, your task oriented people, very reliable. They can get things done. Um, they are 30% of the population, very present oriented people. Uh, they are your next loudest because sometimes what they say about guardians is it's they're right in what they say, but they're not always right in how they say it, right? Because they aren't really people, people necessarily. Um, it depends on where the guardian comes and their voice order. But uh, then we've got connectors. Connectors are your people, people as well. They love hugs. They love being the center of attention. They love bouncing around to people at a party. Um, they, connections are all about these people. Okay. These are the ones that they're always like, I got a guy, right? So if you have a problem, they're, they're what gives them fulfillment is connecting you from your problem to your goal, right? And being that mediator in the middle that really made that connection happen. And they like the acknowledgement of that, okay? Um, it, give, it feeds them. It gives them energy to know that what they did was successful for you. Uh, pioneers, they are your final voice. They are the loudest and the most forceful. 
They are the ones uh, in our group that are very military-like thinking, win at all costs. We're here to win the war, not the battle. They will sacrifice people in the, in the long run to make sure that we ultimately win. Uh, a lot of our leadership falls in this category. We've probably worked with people like this. They can sometimes come off as arrogant, self-centered, uh, bullies at times. If we are unhealthy versions of any of these voices, that's bad. We can be healthy versions of all of these, and that is good for us and for other people around us. So it's really important to understand that as we go forward. This is where communication starts. Starts with us. We have to be self-aware first, then seek to understand the people around us. The more we do that, the more influence we will have with people as we grow. Now, second, relationships. Let's talk about this a little bit. How do we build better relationships? Once we learned how to communicate, right? That's the first module. We go into building relationships. Now I'm going to introduce you to this. This is the influence model. Um, the way we go through this is you've got us on the left, okay? And then we've got our people on the right that we're trying to uh, reach. That could be a customer or a client, or it could be an internal staff member, okay? So there's four really, we call them the four C's that really go into building trust and, uh, and gaining and getting that initial transaction. That transaction doesn't have to be money, right? The transaction could be whatever we were trying to sell to an individual on our team, whether it's an idea or whatever, or sell an actual product or service, um, to somebody else. So we have the first two character chemistry, which are more your feeler type, um, things that people value. So character, are you a good person? Chemistry, do we get along? Okay. Then you also have competency and credibility. Are you good at what you do? And do I trust you to actually get this thing done for me? So once we have those four C's, once somebody has kind of checked those boxes, then we can have a little bit of trust and a transaction actually occurs at that point. Okay. Now what happens, unfortunately, is that we sometimes think, we take that transaction and we consider that the win. And then we just go back and we don't invest more. And that's a loss opportunity. What we need to do once we've gotten to that point and the transaction happens, we need to think there's, so there's these walls of self-preservation. We need to think the first wall of self-preservation that I'm trying to get through is, okay, why am I not investing more in this relationship? What am I trying to hide? What am I trying to prove? And what am I afraid or what am I afraid of losing? Those are the three questions we ask in self-preservation mode. Okay. And once we knock down that barrier with ourselves, then we can start to be on our journey towards more influence and impact with other people and building that relationship. Now, others are also going to have their wall of self-preservation up. Okay. You may experience this on your teams when you're dealing with other people or family members um, or your clients or customers. You may think that um, you're ready to gain influence and impact with them. But they're trying to ask, they're asking these questions. What am I trying to hide? What am I trying to prove to and to whom? And what am I afraid of losing? And they're going to be thinking those questions while this thing's going on, this further influence and impact relationship building experience is happening. So what's important is that we understand those walls of self-preservation. And if you have troubles in your team right now with communication or with relationships and building those, ask yourself those three questions. Encourage that other person to ask themselves those, that, that, those three questions. What am I trying to hide? What am I trying to prove and to whom? And what am I afraid of losing? Okay. Those will help you determine a little bit more of the problem if you're having trouble gaining more influence and impact with somebody. We've got to understand that relationship comes before opportunity. Relationships first, then opportunity. Okay, those are the first two. Now we get to the alignment, right? Now we get to the get on the same page type of language where after we've built the communication, we understand who we are, what we need to do, what we need to be, and we're continuously investing in that, in that communication effort. Then we go on to relationship and we say, okay, now... I'm starting to build trust with this person. Now we're starting to gain influence and impact with this person. And then we get into alignment. Now let's get on the same page. I call this um, the business structure worksheet. I'll give you access to this at the end of the presentation. 
Um, but what the way I use this is we need to all get on the same page with some various things that we need to do. Okay. Uh, top level vision, mission, values, leadership, making sure that the right people are in the right place and that we're all consistent in how we communicate the vision, the mission, the values and our purpose to our audience. And a lot of people, um, don't do this right. I'll straight up say it. A lot of people think vision, mission, values are fluff. And that is because they are not using them correctly. That is because they put them on a wall in their office on the picture of an eagle flying into the sunset. And they has a bunch of generic corporate words on it that don't mean anything. And nobody cares. Um, the secret to gaining more influence and impact and more alignment is giving something to somebody that they can believe. Finding people that believe what you believe, you'll have more dedication, more loyalty, more strength within your organization if that is the case. So understanding your true vision, mission, your values, your purpose, and really the leadership team there is really important to gaining that foundation first. Okay. Um, then we move into strategy and structure. How do we win? How do we make sure that we're going to win internally? What's winning look like externally? What's winning look like? And do we have the right people, systems, and capital? Uh, that's very important in the structure component. Then we get into design. I, I'm, I went to school for design um, 20 years ago, and I have branched more. But this, this is a core thing that I used to focus on, just design, right? Um, but what I realized is I was missing a huge piece of the puzzle. We were designing beautiful work, but what would happen is that it would all go by the wayside because, or not get executed effectively because we didn't have alignment on the internal side. So I've started coaching my clients a lot on the internal side as well. And then we get to tactics. This is, these are the things that people think about first, unfortunately. Okay. I flip this chart upside down sometimes to, to make a, make a point that we should not be starting with tactics. Tactics are the last thing we need to focus on. That is how do we get out to the world? How do we really get our message out? Everybody talks about that because tactics, while important, are also your day-to-day -day thing. That's the thing that comes up every day. It's the battle every day, every day, every day. The problem is tactics are bound to fail. Tactics will fail, but when they fail, are we like freaking now? Or are we okay with them failing? Because our strategy, our brand strategy is on point, is still showing us that the direction we're going in is correct and is right. Okay, so this is an assessment. I'll give you this worksheet. You can go in and what I want you to do is rank from one to 10, how you feel like you do in each one of these categories. And that will help you get a little bit of perspective on alignment within this organization. All right, so we've got communication with five voices. We've got um, relationships with the influence model and understanding how that's going to work. And then we've got alignment, right? And that is with the business structure worksheet and creating more alignment. If we, if we are doing those three things, we are going to start increasing capacity, right? The better we feel, the more invested we are, the more aligned we are, the more effective we can be in the work that we're doing. So when we get into execution now as the fourth module, I have a little something to share here, a little, a little analogy. Um, many of us out there uh, started driving stick shifts when we started uh, learning how to drive. Um, that's what I drove. I know that's what a lot of you probably started driving. Maybe not. Maybe you've never driven a stick shift. Maybe you don't even know how to drive a stick shift. That's totally cool. But here's the idea behind this. Um, I know what this has to do with execution. When I was learning to drive a stick shift, I was completely overwhelmed, right? So, but at the beginning, before I learned to drive, I had seen my parents drive a stick shift. It wasn't anything. I was like, oh, sure. Like they can do it, right? Um, I had this unconscious incompetence, right? I, I wasn't, I didn't know what I didn't know. I just thought, yeah, sure. I could drive a stick shift. No problem. Right. But the day my, I started learning to drive a stick shift, I all of a sudden became aware. I was like, all of a sudden, like, oh my gosh, there's all these mirrors. I've got three pedals. I got to learn how to write the, the exact place to put the clutch in order to engage. I've got all these things to remember. And now 
I'm freaking out a little bit, right? Especially when you're on a hill and somebody's behind you, right? Um, but I'm, I'm freaking out a little bit, not truly understanding. Uh, now I'm truly understanding what I don't know. So I've moved from an, uh, an area of unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence, okay? I've started to realize I don't know what I don't know, right? Um, and then once we journey, once we start driving, we start practicing more, then we start to gain more confidence. We start to understand more. But this is after people have taught us, after people have led us, after people have showed us the way, um, secrets, tips, right? And we gain more experience. Then we move into a realm of conscious competence. And then finally, what happens 20 years later? We're driving a stick show. We don't even think about it, right? It's just second nature to us. We are unconsciously competent. We have mastered the idea of the stick shift. Now, what does this have to do with you and raising capacity in business? We call this the apprenticeship square. Every single one of us have been through this journey in some way, shape, or form while learning a skill on the job and life, building a fence, whatever it is, uh, educating our children. It's all part of this. And I've thought about this tool as my kids have been home, homeschooling, and me trying to show them something, I will pretty much say, and how many times we do this as leaders too, right? With our teams. We are like, okay, I'll do this with my kids at school. Okay, Billy, not his name's not Billy, but hey, go ahead. This is how you do it. All right, I'm going to be off in my meeting. Let me know if you need any help later. I come back and I'm like, dude, what happened? Like, I showed you how to do this thing. Why didn't you do it? You know, um, this is the problem. Okay, up at the top, we see unconscious incompetence. This is how we train, okay? This is how we should train. I do, you watch, okay? So if we're training our children, we're training our employees, we're training our anybody um, on our team and our organization, understand there's an unconscious incompetence. They don't know what they don't know. They think they can drive the stick shift, okay? Because they've seen other everybody else do it, so why can't they do it? But hold on a second, I'm gonna do it, you watch, okay? Then we get over into conscious incompetence. Now we've put them in the driver's seat. Now we say, um, I do, you're gonna help, okay? Um, actually, I'm sorry, this is, this. I, I'm still in the driver's seat a little bit, but they're gonna help me get there, right? Maybe they have been in the driver's seat and I am going to kind of drive, right? I've got that other little secondary steering wheel that we have in the driver's ed cars um, and they're gonna help. And that's the way that it's going to happen. Now, I can't just ditch them at this point because there's a conscious incompetence that happens here. And you notice how the arrow is going down to this area called beware of the pit of despair. Well, what happens is that during this piece of information, during this transfer of conscious incompetence, they start to wonder and self-doubt creeps in. They start to go, am I even the best person for this job? I don't really think I can do this. And we as leaders, we as team members may start to think, hmm, maybe they aren't the right person for this. So doubt creeps in on both sides of the equation. And that's very dangerous. What happens? They end up in the pit of despair because we aren't there to help them along as leaders. They fall in the pit of despair and then they start looking around. There's other people in the pit of despair and they start saying, oh, wow, how long you been down here? And other guys like, oh, I just been down here for a little while now. What they're doing though, is they're, they're just getting by. In the pit of despair, people are just getting by doing the thing they need to do to keep their job and just barely, you know, just eking out some kind of success if we want to call it that. Um, they aren't in the area of conscious competence or unconscious competence. They're just kind of there. Now, what do we do to get them out of the pit of despair? We give them a ladder, right? They could climb out of the pit. We have to be that ladder for them. We have to be the one that raises them up out of the pit of despair. If you're a parent, raise your kids up out of the pit of despair, okay? Raise your wife, your, your husband out of the pit of despair sometimes. Like we've got to help each other out of the pit of despair in life and in business. Um, then we get into you do, I help conscious competence. They're becoming more confident. They're starting to really embrace this thing. There's, they still need some help. They still need to be aware of what they're doing. Then they bridge into unconscious competence. They don't even have to think about it anymore. It's second nature to them. They've learned the skill and then they need to learn a new skill. 
unconscious incompetence happens again, right? So this thing goes around and around and around because we are never done, okay? Training ourselves, training other people on how to be more effective. You see how this can work with execution? We can create more effective execution, okay? If we are training people correctly. Communication, number one. Building relationships, number two. Getting aligned, number three and executing effectively, number four. All of those things are going to lead to effective increasing capacity. Time, what, the other things people need to get out of the pit of despair. Number one is time. Formal and informal time. Formal time, okay, like that is uh, just, it's on the books, it's on, on their schedule, it's what it is. Informal time though is where a lot of relationships and communication is built. That is the informal time of, hey, Let's sit down for a minute for, for some coffee or let, let's go out to lunch. Like, let's see, how are you doing? What's going on with you in life? Um, that is really important, giving people the right amount of time. They need vision, short and long-term vision. Short-term vision is this is where we're doing. This is what the task is. Long-term vision is this is where we're going. This is where I see you progressing, okay? They need to understand your expectations. A lot of us don't communicate expectations. We assume people just know. Um, as a creative myself, remember the five voices, creatives have a hard time communicating effectively all the time. Sometimes my team wonders where they stand because I'm just like, oh man, you thought that? Oh, I didn't mean for you to think that. That's not what I meant. Right. But they just didn't quite understand what I was trying to say or what was going on in my head didn't come out, um, effectively. All right. So then we need a encouragement, encouragement. We need a specific encouragement not generic encouragement. Generic encouragement is like, hey, good job, Nancy, and then leaving, right? Specific encouragement is, hey, great job on that project yesterday. You really nailed that. Um, how did you feel you did? Like what, you know, going into the specifics, helping the, recognizing the efforts that they're making to get out of that pit of despair, okay? Those are the three things we need to do with our children, right? And our family members, as well as in business and what we need to do to help grow our teams. Finally, capacity. We do these four things really well at the beginning. You are going to increase capacity without more time, without more money, without more people. You will be able to increase capacity if you are optimizing those first four steps. Now, once we get to capacity, here's what happens with our brains, right? In our brain, we start to battle this inhibition versus prohibition thing, okay? What we need to think about is during a crisis, like right now, okay, are we sitting there just with our hands in the air thinking, oh, well, we can't do that. They said we couldn't do that, so we just can't do that, right? Who is they? Like there's a lot of they's out there that we tend to blame on why we aren't taking action. They said we couldn't do that. They said we we shouldn't do that. We we can't do that because of this situation, right? Like during this time, I've heard a lot of um, prohibition statements thrown out there. Now, what happens is that what we have found is that really a lot of prohibition statements are actually inhibition statements. There are things in our mind that we are saying to ourselves over and over again that are limiting our belief to actually accomplish what it is we're trying to accomplish. So the prohibition saying, oh, we, you know, some certain restriction, then we sit on our hands and our inhibition is really saying, yeah, there's no hope for that. There's no hope for us. We just need to hope that this all passes soon and that we can all get our, get on our feet. And well, right. Like instead of rethinking, reimagining, re-strategizing, which I've encouraged a lot of my clients to do, what we've been working on, we have, you know, you sit on your hands and do nothing which is a very risky place to be. So if you do that, those first four things, or if you're not doing those first four things, is it inhibition creating the reason why you're not doing those or is it a prohibition? So I want you to think about those things. So this is how these pieces and these tools different fit into the flywheel, right? Communication with five voices and understanding what that is. If you've done DISC, that's fine. If you've done Myers-Briggs or Enneagram, that's fine. If those work for you, then great. Um, five voices, we layer on top of some of those to really give some context. And uh, then you build relationships through the influence model and understanding what that is, alignment through the business structure, 
execution through the apprenticeship model and really understanding how to train people and then really the capacity component. And this goes round and round and around. You need to continue to work on this as we go forward. I want to introduce you to a quick tool, um, and this is free for 30 days. If you want to register for this, um, I strongly encourage you to, and I'll tell you why in just a second. So if you go to giant.tv slash 30 days at the bottom, you will get uh, a free 30 day access. This is my affiliate code. I wouldn't, I'm not affiliate for anything I don't believe in or really use myself, uh, but this I do. I use this tool almost every day with my clients and with myself. Um, is a super, it's like Netflix for scalable people development. Okay. Is what we call it. Cause everybody can access this thing. It's so affordable. If you have a group of people, it's $4 and 99 cents a month. I mean, honestly, that's crazy. You can't get any kind of leadership help for that much ever. Um, and the impact of the tool is great. So if you click in that bottom right hand corner, when you get there on that little red icon, you'll see a menu pop up and you go to surveys and you can take kind of a leadership 360. Okay. Or a team 360 is what we call it. And you can go to each one of these modules, take this little survey and understand where each of you rank on your team. And if you're interested in this, um, I can set your team up with an admin and that admin can see all the data based on where you rank, how you're doing and understand um, where your team's fallen short and what to do about that. You can likewise go to assessments and this is the five voices assessment. If you are an assessment junkie, if you've taken all the Enneagram disc, um, Myers-Briggs, and you want to take this one as well, go for it. Um, it'll give you kind of your Myers-Briggs breakdown. You can see where they align. But uh, the five voices assessment is free and it's on here as well. Now, what I want to talk to you briefly is quickly, I've talked to you about internal brand and external brand. Okay. I want to talk about the intersection of those two things briefly. This is brand heaven. There's brand hell as well, but I'm going to really introduce you really quick to brand heaven and the way we build uh, brand loyalty through our engagement, through our relationships in order to increase capacity. We start with positive interactions, okay, with our clients and with our employees and team, both. We need to have positive interactions, then be consistent in those interactions, okay? Consistency breeds uh, well-being, right? Comfort, security. Once something's inconsistent, we kind of start, kind of start to put our guard up, right? Um, credibility. Then we start to become credible. After we've become consistent in those interactions, we become credible. Um, we start to build authenticity. Our feelings start to take over. And then we build more trust. We start to trust people with some information. Um, and then we build loyalty over time. And that is really what loyalty is all about. And that's how we um, decrease turnover, both on the internal side with our employees and also on the external side, churn rate with our, our members or our clients or, or whoever's purchasing what we have to offer. Build loyalty. And then as we get into it, this is kind of my Venn diagram I created where first I talk about brand with companies, really talk about how you differentiate yourself. How do you remain consistent and aligned in what you do and how you communicate what you are to the outside world and to your inside world. Um, culture, we build on atmosphere, people development, dedication. This workshop has been more about the culture side of things. Um, both of these are what I call internal brand development. Okay. And then we focus on the external brand development side. So as a designer, we work on your design. Um, this lends, this builds credibility, quality, and uh, clarity about what you offer to the world and tactics. How do you get your message out to the world? How are you building awareness about your product and your price and what you have to offer? And that is external brand development. All of these are need to be connected. You cannot truly be effective on the external side unless you are effective and healthy on the internal side. And that is why I talk about both always. My Angelou said this, and I want you to think about this on both sides, internal and external. People may not remember what you did or what you said but they will remember how you made them feel. Okay. On the internal side, people will always remember what I said as a leader or what my team member said in that meeting, or maybe they will, or what our companies actually said, but they will remember how we made them feel, right? Do they feel like they're part of something? Do they feel like we're giving them enough um, responsibility and authority to actually carry out their tasks on the external side? People not, won't always remember what we did or said, but they'll remember how we made them feel. Are we serving them? Are we offering enough help for our customers and clients to build that, um, uh, that, build that brand long-term? 
Now, what I want to talk to you about is, um, and bring this all back to being a 100x leader, 100x organization. And what that means is uh, that we need to be 100% healthy, strive to be 100% healthy. None of us will be 100% healthy, um, but we need to strive to get there and to multiply that health to other people around us. Uh, we can't just be a 65 plus leader. A 65 health and really just adding value is like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of healthy and oh, my door is always open. That's not multiplication. 100x is I'm trying to be 100% healthy myself and multiply this health into other people around me. That builds better communication, better relationships, better alignment, better execution, and increases our capacity if we are working on that for long term. So what I want you to think at the end, this is what I'm posing, the question I'm posing to you. How much is your reputation worth? Think about that. Your reputation in your community, with your family, with your friends, with your organization, with your team, how much is your reputation worth? I would gamble it's worth a lot. So what I want you to do is I want you to be a leader worth following. Now, when I say leader, I mean, I want you to be a brand worth following. I want you to be something that people want to follow, not something they have to follow. And that is what we talk about when we're talking about, um, you know, building a team in the right way, building a team that fosters engagement and that really raises capacity when it may not be possible to hire new people or when we our budgets are cut, right? When things outside forces, prohibitions are put on us, are we just sitting on our hands? Or are we building something worth following? Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, thanks, Adam, for inviting me to be here as well. I would love um, if there are any questions. Oh, really quick. If you want access to those assessments, those free assessments, as well as um, a link to Giant TV and some other resources for free, um, type the word culture brand. That's one word. Your phone may try to autocorrect culture brand and make it two. Make sure it's one word to 31996. And you will get an email from me that will have those links in the email for you. So um, again, if you text that 31996, text the word culture brand to that, and you should get access to those free resources. And uh, I really, again, appreciate it. Um, if there's any questions, Adam, I'm game. Yeah. Actually on the line cool. over cameras real quick there we go okay so first one from jerry uh the percentages you have on nurture creative guardian connector and pioneer is that the reality of most organizations or the desired makeup of staff so that is actually the the makeup based on myers-briggs science so of all the people that have taken Myers-Briggs, um, the numbers boil down to that. So that's not necessarily the ideal re ratio we want. That is a fact um, of data. That's a data-driven number um, that, you know, 40%, 43% of the population is our nurturers, okay? Based on the people that have taken Myers-Briggs. Um, that's a lot of people. And so that that's pretty accurate data. 43% are nurturers. Um, and I would 70% of that 43% are actually women, um, that are in that, that bucket. So what you want to do is your team, you know, that's, what's interesting is that if you have your team go on and take all the five voices assessment, uh, they can all register for their own account for free. Use that link. You'll get 30 days for free. You can test drive and do whatever you want and then cancel. Um, you don't have to put payment information or anything, but if you go on, all of you take that assessment and kind of see where your breakdown is, you may notice that your team is heavily lopsided to more feeler type people, nurturers, connectors, versus, you know, maybe it's very heavily lopsided to pioneers and guardians, right? That are more um, not so people, people, uh, more data driven type personality. So, really, what you want is a mix because they all bring something to the table. Each one of those voices, we are all all of those voices, okay? We're not just one or the other. We are all of them, just we have a tendency to be one over another one. So that's that's the breakdown of 
the numbers. Okay. Uh, next question we have from Sam. Uh, can can the people in the middle of an organization do this without the support of uh, or guidance from the top? Can we brand in the middle internally? Yes. Okay. So uh, if I understand this correctly, um, some organizations are large, right? Uh, I am actually doing this with the CDC right now, uh, the Centers for Disease Control, where um, I'm not doing training for the entire agency. I am coming in to a specific division. It's actually the opioid division um, and injury prevention to go in with their team. They have a new turnover. Um, it's about 25 people within that or within that division uh, or that team that has um, shifted some places. Now they have a new team. They've grown because of the opioid crisis and they have wanted, they brought me in to do two things, okay? They've brought me in to help them learn how to communicate more effectively as a team. And they've also brought me in because I do both external and internal brand to help shape the vision, to create more alignment with who they are as a division inside of the greater CDC whole. How can they play a role in building up what they're trying to do as a bigger piece of the overall vision, okay? You're, you may not be able to affect, right? The CDC's umbrella of who that brand is, what it is, that's a monster, right? But you do have control over yours. If you have a team of three people, create a vision mission for yourself. If you're a person of one, create a vision mission purpose and values for yourself. I call it personal brand development, right? Understand where you fit into the giant cog. I hope that answered your question, Sam. If not, then um, let me know. Excellent. So uh, next one on the list, what are the best practices to increase engagement while working remotely? Oh, goodness. Okay. So I actually have another um, webinar series or another webinar I did a few weeks ago all about leading. It was four principles to leading your team uh, more effectively, uh, leading your remote team more effectively. And uh, I've talked to Adam a little bit about, about that one as well. So if that's something of interest, I could, I could possibly share that. But there's a few tools that I do in there um, that, again, I apply to things in the past, things in the future, but also during a crisis right now when everybody was working remote. Um, one thing you need to do is understand the power of the medium. Okay, A lot of us, when we are working remote, are really in task mode, right? I feel like a lot of people generally feel like they can get more done at home. Um, interesting enough, I guess the kids are home too, homeschooling, which makes it a little bit more difficult right now. But when you're working remote, some people feel like they get more done. They're not being bothered by, by colleagues in their office. They're not, you know, standing in the lunchroom talking for an extra hour, right? Like people just feel more productive. The problem is we don't space out time uh, for ourselves. We don't block out calendar correctly to make sure that other team members don't interrupt us when we're in what we call gear five mode. That's another, that's a preview for what I could, another tool I could share with you guys. Um, but also understand the power of the medium. The medium meaning if I need to bring effective challenge, if I need to talk about something with my team, it's super easy for us, right? To just text or to Slack message or to throw out an email. Cause then I don't have to stop my flow, right? I can just keep crunching. But what's really the problem is that things get misinterpreted. Um, things don't get communicated effectively and problems happen. So what we need to do is take the time to engage when we can't always have face-to-face -face interaction is we need to engage in as much uh, video conferencing as we can, especially when we have uh, to bring effective challenge to those around us. Um, to make sure the body language is all there and everything else. So, no, I think that's an excellent question just because uh, I think sending messages in this kind of medium right now in the current quarantine uh, gives the illusion of urgency, which doesn't necessarily the case. And, and you're right, you have a hard time sometimes breaking away time for yourself or realizing that, you know, just because you get an email or you're sending someone else an email, you don't necessarily have to be responsive right away. You still need to organize your tasks yourself, right? So yeah, uh, and I think it's a, a setting up expectations. That's like, hey, if I email you, I don't expect like a response right now. Like you have a little bit of time, right? Like, and being clear in your communication, your expectations as a team of what the different mediums actually mean. Yeah. 
there we go. <laughs> Next question that we have is, uh, okay, Karen Hayes Ryan, does this work better before or after a major organization? Reor sorry, reorganization. Often in government, we reorganize uh, first and then try to figure out how to work together. Sometimes it seems that we ought to know what we have and identify shortfalls before we reorganize. Oh, amen. Mm -mm. Okay, so this is what happens, okay? This happens in the government sector. This happens in the private sector, um, both, okay? they uh, I've had in the past clients come to me and say, hey, Scott, um, we just opened our doors three months ago and nobody's buying our stuff. And I'm like, so like, why didn't you come to me like six months, nine months ago when you're thinking about launching this thing, right? Like, you know, the problem is that's where we get stuck in tactics, right? We know we have to do something. So we just hunker down and do it. And then we wonder why it's not working. Why isn't this effective? We, we did the thing, right? We launched our website or we're having our team meetings. Like we're doing what we're supposed to do, but those tactics don't lead to effective change. They don't lead to effectiveness um, or increased capacity. What's really important is to understand the steps, the strategy that needs to come in the creation of those things, right? If we had strategy up front, strategy is your blueprint. Strategy, you, why would we ever build a house without first creating a blueprint, right? I can't imagine a team going to the World Cup, the finals of the World Cup without a strategy. They're just like, yeah, we're just going to go play. Nobody does that. But in the world of business and organizations and associations, we do it all the time, um, which is a problem. So my viewpoint, before the reorg happens, right? You engage, you start to understand what you want. You start to do what I call market research, but market research on the external side and the internal side um, to understand what we need to do. Where are the holes that we need to fill? Doing what I did, on, uh, showed you on the giant TV, doing a team 360 understanding the gaps you need to fill. Where are we weak? Where are we strong? Who Who's in the right seat and who isn't? Who could we switch around? Um, but you know what? It's a living, breathing organism. That's all not always possible. So is it possible afterwards? Of course it is. It's not impossible. It's just better to do beforehand. Well, uh, so another great question here. Uh, how does... Uh, how much does social media influence branding and how can it be used to increase capacity? All right. Um, I Loaded think, questions here. That's a big one. Yeah. Goodness gracious. Social media. Um, I think social media, again, is a tactic. Okay. Um, it is just another means of communication. And I think a lot of people um, don't think about their strategy when it comes to social media. Um, so really quick, Adam. Read that question to me, and there's two there's two questions in there. Yes. Yeah, so the first one is how much does social media influence branding? Okay, influences it a, a lot. Okay, the way you communicate, and I actually do another social media presentation about building your brand via social media. Um, it's all about I call it the eight deadly don'ts of social media. Um, it's just like at a party, at a networking event, whatever. Okay, think about it. A lot of us tend to launch like 12 social media platforms because we're like, oh my gosh, we got to get on TikTok. Oh my gosh, we got to be on Instagram. Oh my gosh, we got to be launching a YouTube channel. We got to do all these things. But what happens is figuratively, I show up to the party, right? I'm like, hey, everybody. And then two, three hours later, nobody knows where Scott is, but they look and I'm like, pass out in the corner, right? Like I came to the party and then I just pass out in the corner. That's what happens with social media. We come to the party because we think we got to be there but we don't have the capacity, right, to manage it correctly. And what happens is we just pass out. Three months goes by, we haven't posted anything on Instagram, right? We haven't launched a new YouTube video. Like that's a problem. Inconsistency of communication causes people to think that, hold on a second, I haven't heard from you in forever. And now all of a sudden, six months later, you're popping up in my feed? Like, that's weird. You know, like what happened to you? You don't want people thinking that about your brand, right? You don't want people to be like, man, where have you been, right? Do we wanna feel that way about, you know, our pizza restaurant down the street or whatever? That's a problem. 
So yeah, I think uh, I think uh, so. So I, I can talk on that note a little bit. Yeah. So with my brand uh, for Project Geospatial over the last ten years, there's been a lot of hard lessons learned. Uh, in that, you know, I you know the beginning we were just like that, jumping on every social media platform out there, but then I realized, uh, you know, what was a I got spread too thin. Can't manage all those different accounts at once. So then I started looking at automated ways of sending message out to all of them. But then you lose something else. You lose yeah. uh, being personable with your audience, and then you just look like another bot out there. So then, you know, I'd say the last five years started being a lot more streamlined. You know, uh, how can you be? Uh, how, how can you be more attentive on the audience and scale as you're able to handle that capacity going out? And this way, you know, you build those audiences on those platforms and you scale out as you're ready to do it, not based off of, oh, I got to go chase this, this, this person over here who's on this platform, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because you know what? The people that we see on all those platforms doing all that stuff have teams of people doing that stuff for them, right? Um, you may not. If you do have a team to be able to help you with your content strategy and your social media strategy and how to structure that. Um, that's awesome. If you go to that free resources tab on my uh, website, you'll, there's actually a little, a bucket down there, a mini lesson. It's a seven day mini lesson about creating a year's worth of content. Um, that's one of the biggest problems with social media I find is, is how do we create effective content for our audience? So how do you increase, was the other, second part of that, how do you increase capacity with social media? How can it be used to increase capacity, uh, with social media? Yes. Okay. I almost think it's a, I don't know. I don't know how you can increase capacity with social media as much as it is your increased capacity that you free up from doing all the other things will help you be more effective with your social media. I guess I would almost switch it a little bit um, that way. Because well, I think this is a good lead into our last question that we have. Okay. Uh, what are some of the ways to foster a, a better foster collaboration and communication and build relationships between different companies and organizations? So I know that's there's some overlap there with using those tools like social media to do that. Uh, but but go, go ahead with that one. So how do we, so read one more time. How do you foster? What are the, what are some of the ways to better foster collaboration and communication and build relationships between different companies and organizations? Okay. So, and I, I would imagine a lot of you have been in this space, right? But I, um, I use LinkedIn a lot for collaboration, um, and networking with other business leaders. Uh, it's a little less spammy, although now it's getting pretty spammy. Um, but I think those connections are really, really important that you build via social media. It's a medium in order to start to build a relationship with somebody. Start doing partnerships. Start doing traded offers like, hey, uh, I've got this thing I'm trying to get out to my audience. Maybe there's somebody in another association, another agency, another business that also has my target audience and I share their target audience. What if we traded a little bit of free offers? What if we did a partner webinar? What if we um, did something to help each other, right? Social media is a means to get to that point. Partnerships now are almost more effective than any type of marketing activity, I think. I think it's all about relationships. It's all about partnership. It's always been about relationships and partnerships. But I think now um, in a world of inauthenticity and people fumbling all over each other and spammy ads and banners and all kinds of stuff that what we really crave is trust from those people around us. And I think social media is just a means to get there. Excellent. No, and I also want to highlight to our audience, a lot of them work in, you know, government spaces on more isolated networks and a lot of the right. same, we'll call it, uh, social tools and uh, mediums that we use here on the outside, there's actually equivalents on the inside of those networks too. And all the skills that you've uh, you've highlighted here, all the all the uh, best practices, uh, trade out the names, and you can use those skills and uh, and methods within those networks as well. Building your brand doesn't have to be something that's public facing to the tools that exist out here. You can do it on all different levels, even within isolated networks of uh, organizations. Uh, that's why I also want to highlight because a lot of these individuals, a lot of the folks who are participating in this conference, 
don't have that level of exposure to uh, what you and I have, Scott. So right. okay. um, they're 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 really more confined to a, a different level of audience, different different isolated uh, layer. So. Yep. Uh, with that said, I would uh, like to thank you for coming on with us. We do not have any more questions, thank and uh, it's been an excellent presentation. So we're going to have you. uh, your your show notes uh, within the episode description afterwards, posted on the website within a couple hours, the recorded session, and any other relevant details that uh, you'd like to share as well. So rocking! I really appreciate them. It's been good. Awesome. Well, uh, everybody, uh, we look forward to the next presentation uh, in, uh, let me do a quick uh, sanity check here. Uh, got too many, got way too many windows up. But here we go. The next speaker will be uh, in two days, May 8th, 1300 Eastern Standard Time, uh, Tyrone Smith, Designing Your Business, the Business Model uh, Canvas. So, uh, and we'll, uh, stay, stay tuned for that. If you would like to participate in the conference, there's still plenty of time. We're still onboarding presenters, speakers, and, uh, and, and check out everything within the media library and, uh, engage, engage, collaborate. We have the discord channel set up, uh, uh, reach out to us. We don't want, we want to make sure that this is, uh, we're all talking to each other and this isn't just a showroom for videos and presentations. So. Uh, and that's all I got. See everybody next time. <laughs>